This is a Reconstructionist Radio production. Please visit cmfnow.com to purchase this book. Victory in Jesus, the Bright Hope of Postmillennialism by Greg L. Bonson Edited by Robert R. Booth Copyright 1999 Bonson Family Trust Covenant Media Press In Memory of Greg L. Bonson who now abides in the presence of his Lord. Chapter 1. Understanding the Book of Revelation Everyone wants to know the future. If your interest is in economics, then you love it if you are right about the future. If you can know what is predictable, you can get ahead in the market. Or in other areas, you might be able to get ahead politically or socially if you just know what the future has to hold. But our desire to know the future is not just for personal gain or economic and political aspirations. We are simply prone to be curious about such things. We would kind of like to know what is going to happen down the line. From a Christian standpoint, our interest in the future goes way beyond a mere curiosity and certainly goes beyond a desire for personal aggrandizement. We would like to know what God has in store for the future of planet Earth because we are part of his kingdom. We are part of his plan, and we need to be thinking his thoughts after him. We need to get with the program. What is it that God intends to do in the future? Christians have argued about this for a long time, and they continue to argue about it. That is one problem. A second problem is that sometimes this issue of what God intends to do in the future is a very difficult one for people. How can we understand all these prophecies, and how could we make the Bible come together in a coherent way? We are often intimidated by what appears to be the difficulty of the subject, so we have Christians arguing over it, and we have the difficulty of the subject. The end result is that the vast majority of people in the pew just say, I can't figure this out. There are some reasons for encouragement in this area of theology. First, this portion of God's holy word is not so obscure that we cannot understand it. Second, we will be encouraged because God has good news for the future. I am a theologian who is not a pessimist about what is going to be happening in the future. I do not think this is the late great planet Earth. There is a glorious future ahead, even though there may be many judgments and tough times that we have to go through in the process of reaching that ultimate goal. Nevertheless, I have no doubt that the Bible teaches us that God, who is sovereign over all affairs, is not going to turn history over to the devil. He is not going to let planet Earth just totally degenerate. In fact, his kingdom is going to be the final word. He is going to govern the nations upon the earth. That means we have a glorious future to look forward to. I could probably sell you optimism or wishful thinking, since we all want to believe that is true. The good news is, however, that I am not just offering, I hope, I hope, I am showing you that God's word actually gives substance to that hope, so that it is not just wishful thinking. There is a glorious future. We have great confidence about the future if we pay attention to what God's word teaches us. Interpreting the Book of Revelation Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 that all scripture is inspired by God, and since it is inspired by God, it is his own word and it is profitable or beneficial for teaching, correcting, reproving, and giving us instruction in righteousness so that we may be thoroughly furnished to every good work. All scripture has that beneficial character. That means that this book of Revelation is beneficial to us. It can only be beneficial, however, if we read and understand it. This is where many start out very hesitant because they find the book of Revelation difficult and hard to understand. So, let us consider some background and structure that will allow us to reap the benefits of this portion of God's Word. The title of the book is called Revelation. The Greek word for revelation is apocalypsis, which means unveiling or pulling back the veil. The sad fact is that many Christians look upon the book of Revelation not as pulling back of the veil so that we might see the truth, but rather as God pulling the veil together and obscuring it so that we will not be able to see clearly. 
As a result, we are confused and there is all this controversy. We should, however, take heart just from the title of the book itself. It is the unveiling. God says, if you want to know what this is all about, if you want to know where things are going, then let me pull the curtain back for you. This is the revelation, not the obscuring, not the closing of the veil, but the opening of the veil, so that we might be able to understand what God intends to do. He does not want to blind us in our outlook and our attitudes. He wants to open our eyes so that we can see. Moreover, we should notice that in the book of Revelation, Revelation 1-3, we are told that God expects us to respond in a certain way to the book. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. God expects us to keep the book of Revelation. This does not mean to keep it in hand. It means that we are to respond to it obediently. God is calling on us to act a certain way in our lives in the midst of history because of what he is going to unveil to us in this book. So, if we do not read the book, and if we do not bother to understand it properly, then how can we obey it and benefit from it as God intended? While the book may seem difficult, let us look at a couple of things in the book of Revelation that indicate that God does not intend for it to be so hard to understand. For the sake of one illustration, consider Revelation 17. After John has been shown a very distressing picture of a harlot who is sprawled out over the heads of seven-headed beast, whose name is Babylon the Great, mother of harlots, and of the abominations of the earth, we read at the end of verse 6, when I saw her, I wondered greatly. Now, the sense of wonder is not just standing back in curiosity with John saying, Wow, what does that mean? The wonder here is a trembling kind of wonder. John says, This is really distressing and very confusing. What should he make of this? Notice what verse 7 says. And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns, the beast that you saw. And then the angel goes on to explain. This should be a comforting verse. The angel says, Why are you so confused? Why are you trembling in confusion and distress, John? I will tell you what it means. God did not give us the book of Revelation to make us stand back and ask, What on earth could that mean? I guess we will just have to leave it to the guys who are preaching and then close our Bibles and go away. God wants us to understand this. God wants us to read his word and get the benefit that he intends from that word. That is why, along the way, he explains what the book is all about. The book is not really all that difficult to put together. Particular sections or images may be hard for us, but overall, we can see what the book of Revelation is all about. Of course, the book is going to be undoubtedly troublesome if we try to read it for something it does not intend to be. If we take out our instructions for putting together a bicycle and try to read it according to the same principles as poetry, then we are not going to make a whole lot of sense out of putting the bicycle together. Likewise, if we think reading a last will and testament is the same as reading the TV guide, and we try to apply principles for the TV guide to the will, then we are not going to be able to make any sense of it. If we do not come to the book of Revelation with respect for the kind of literature it is, then of course it is going to be nonsense to us. To put it simply, the book of Revelation is highly figurative literature. There are visions and symbols and so forth. What often happens is that many Christians, in fact, there's a whole school of thought that is famous for doing this, go to the book of Revelation as though it's a newspaper account written ahead of time. Then, from the newspaper account, they build their charts and do all that sort of things. Is the book of Revelation written like a newspaper? No. Is it a report similar to what you might read in the New York Times? Of course not. The book of Revelation is very figurative. It has a lot of imagery and a lot of symbols. When people say we should interpret the Bible literally, we should understand that nobody could, without hypocrisy, make that claim. 
No one reads the book of Revelation literally. If what is meant by literally is that we interpret according to the actual words rather than according to some preconceived idea or some spiritual insight we get between the lines, then fine. We do, by the letter, literally read the book of Revelation and interpret it. However, we do not think that the book of Revelation and all of what it has to say is devoid of figures of speech or images that have to be interpreted. For example, there is in Revelation 13 the description of the beast. The beast has seven heads and ten horns and comes up out of the Mediterranean Sea. While that could be literal, I do not know of anyone in the Christian church that interprets it as an actual monster God has created for the occasion. The book of Revelation is not read literally by anyone, and yet there is a particular school of thought, the dispensational school, whose approach to reading the book of Revelation has a lot of hypocrisy on its hands that needs to be washed clean. Over and over again, people are browbeat who are trying to be faithful and honest in reading God's word, and they are browbeat by dispensationalists who will say that if you do not interpret it our way, you are not being literal. Therefore, you are playing fast and loose with the text of Scripture. Be assured, dispensationalists do not read the book of Revelation literally. They could not. Nobody with any literary sensibility could. And so, that is okay. I do not mind that dispensationalists will interpret the beast in a figurative way. What I do mind is that when I interpret things differently than they do, they turn around and say that the problem is they are literalists and I am not. No one reads the book of Revelation literally. You have to understand the kind of literature it is. It is very visionary, very dramatic, and highly figurative. And that increases the distress of those who are hesitant about the book to begin with. So, how can we understand these things? Remember the angel? God is going to tell us what these things mean. We all have an ability to take a piece of literature, at least if it's clearly written, as this book is, and to make sense out of it, even though it is highly figurative. We will see that once we go through the outline of this book, that it is not really all that difficult. What is the book all about? What is the bottom line? After we have interpreted all of these figures and we have gone through the outline, what does God want us to know from the book of Revelation? Very simply, God wants us to know that His kingdom, the kingdom of His Son Jesus Christ, is going to triumph over all opposition. Background of the book of Revelation John was on the island of Patmos for the word of God when he wrote the book of Revelation. He was being persecuted and was now exiled because of his testimony to the word of God. The Christian church was also undergoing persecution at this time. In the days of the Emperor Nero, Christians were persecuted in such a way that they would be impaled alive on a stake. Then pitch would be put on their body and they would be lit on fire. Nero would take these burning Christians and light his garden parties at night with their burning bodies. There was that kind of hatred for those who named the name of Christ. In the early days of the Roman Empire, there was in Asia the development of what came to be known as the emperor cult, the worship of the emperor as God himself. This eventually spread throughout the entire Roman Empire, but especially in Asia Minor where the seven churches of Jesus Christ are identified. On that very soil, persecution came to those who would not put incense on the bust of the emperor and say, Caesar is Lord. When Christians say, no, Jesus is Lord, we will not give that title to Caesar, they were killed. Often the Christians were thrown to the lions or put into the stadium for people to look upon and be entertained as they were being killed. There was great hatred of the Christian church. On top of that, the early days of the church were made worse because those who should have been the closest to Christians and understanding the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy, those who had traditionally and historically been identified as the people of God, the Jews themselves persecuted the Christians. 
As we read the book of Acts, the Jews stirred up trouble for Christians. Over and over again, Luke points out to us how it was that the Jews created difficulty for those who had come to see Jesus as the Messiah. On one hand, you have the Jews persecuting the church and stirring up trouble for it. On the other hand, the Roman world in Asia Minor and in the very heart of the empire was also persecuting Christians. It is in the midst of all this persecution that John writes from his exile and says, I have good news for you. Jesus is going to triumph over all opposition. That is the theme of the book of Revelation. Timing. What period of time is John talking about? The book of Revelation itself identifies for us when the main body of its own prophecy is going to be fulfilled. Consider the first and last chapters. Both at the beginning and at the end of the book, John tells us what he is talking about. In Revelation 1, 1 through 3, we see the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show unto his servants even things which must soon take place, and he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. In essence, the book of Revelation begins by asking, Why are you worried about Henry Kissinger being the beast? Why are you projecting all of these things way out into the future? And John says, What I am talking about is near at hand. Now, there is nothing in human communication that requires that every single thing that John talks about has to be near at hand. He is generalizing. He is talking about the most basic, essential purpose of the book. He says, what I am talking about here is the prophecy of what will shortly come to pass. This is a great verse to take back to our dispensational friends, not to needle them, but to perhaps help them and say, how about John's language here? Are you a literalist about these words? How is it that must soon take place, or time is near, turns out to be 2,000 years later? No one in his right mind thinks must soon take place, or time is near, means 2,000 years down the road. The book of Revelation tells us at the very beginning that the main body of what John is talking about is in the near purview of future for John and his hearers, the ones who are undergoing this persecution. Looking at the last chapter of Revelation, we see that this time reference is repeated for us so that we have a kind of bracketing device at the very beginning and at the very end of the book. Revelation 22.6 And he said to me, These words are faithful and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angels to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And in verse 10 we read, And he said to me, Do not seal up the words of the prophecy of this book. Why? For the time is near. John does not bother to seal up this prophecy as though it is for some future day. For the time is near. These things are going to begin happening right away. So, at the beginning and end of the book of Revelation, we have been told clearly by God when these things will take place. It is to our shame, and it is to our fault, if we do not understand the book, because we're caught up in whether Hitler or Henry Kissinger or Bill Clinton or whoever it may be is found in the book of Revelation. The main body of teaching in this book has to do with John's own day, the generation shortly to follow the early days of the church. Outline of the Book of Revelation The Book of Revelation has its own outline. You know the old saying, when all else fails, read the instructions. Well, if we are having trouble understanding the Book of Revelation, then we have not been paying attention to it since the book of Revelation has its own interpretive guide built right into it. We see it in Revelation 1.19. What it has led up to verse 19 
is that John has been given a vision of the glorified Christ. And he describes this glorious vision of Christ for us in the middle section of chapter 1. Revelation 1.12 says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned I saw seven golden lampstands. And then he describes this glorious person. When he finished seeing and describing this, John is taken back by it. Verse 19 gives his commission. We read, Therefore write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. That is it, very simply. John, write about what you have seen already. Write about the things which are contemporary, currently the case, and those things which will shortly come to pass hereafter. In Revelation 4, 1, we have language that also helps us if we are trying to be good interpreters of Scripture and good detectives. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard, like the sound of a trumpet speaking with me, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after these things. Revelation 1.19 tells us that we have three sections in this book. 1. What John has already seen. 2. What is now the case. And 3. What will be hereafter. Revelation 4.1 says, Now I am going to show you the things hereafter, so we know where we can find the breaks. What has John seen previously? We find this in chapter 1. The vision of the glorified Savior in the midst of the seven candle stands. The candle stands are the churches. And Jesus says, I am with the church. I walk in the midst of the church. And I walk in the midst of the church not as the same nefarious spirit, but as a glorified sovereign Savior. Does this sound like anything else we have heard in the New Testament? What does Jesus say right before he is ascending to the right hand of God? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Matthew 28, 18 and 20. This is God's glorious, symbolic, figurative repeating of that promise. Jesus said, I am with my church, and I am the glorified Savior. I am the Sovereign. I govern and judge over all. John, write what you have seen. We are given in the first third of the book of Revelation, not in terms of total words, but in terms of the outline that God has in mind, the first thing that we need to know about this book. It assures us that in the midst of great persecution, in the midst of terrible times for God's people, Christ is with his church, and he is the sovereign one. Next, John is told to write the things which are. Looking at chapters 2 and 3, we can do this by subtraction. We know chapter 4 begins hereafter, and we know that chapter 1 dealt with the things that he has seen previously. That leaves chapters 2 and 3. When we look at chapters 2 and 3, we see the letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. What persistent theme do we find in these letters to the seven churches? There is a pattern for all these letters, with one little exception. The general pattern we find in all seven of these letters to the churches of Asia Minor is that, first of all, we have an address to the angel, the minister of the church, the one who is the messenger of God to the church. Then Christ is given a particular designation that is taken from the vision in Revelation 1. There is a commendation of the church, a rebuke of the church, an exhortation, then the formula, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then a promise is made. In every case, the promise has to do with overcoming and triumphing. He who overcomes, he who perseveres in victory, is given the promise that follows. In terms of what God wanted John to give to us, 
We now understand two-thirds of the outline. The first thing we need to know is that Christ, the sovereign, glorified Savior, is in the midst of his church. Secondly, he speaks directly to his church. He says, Repent of the things that are wrong. Be encouraged by my presence, and know that I will give a reward to those who overcome, those who are victorious in my name. We come to chapter 4 and begin the things which shall be hereafter. Hereafter. How far hereafter are we talking about? For the most part, we are talking about the generations of the early church, because the beginning and end of the book has already told us these are things that are shortly to come to pass. This does not prevent John from eventually looking ahead to the second coming of Jesus Christ and the new heavens and the new earth, but that is the postscript at the end of the book. The main body of the prophecy of the things to take place hereafter, chapter 4 to the middle of chapter 20, have to do with two particular dramas that John is going to play out for us. How do we know that this section is to be broken down into two particular sections? There is a literary clue here that we have to pick up on. It is not esoteric and it is not difficult. It is unfortunate that so many people have suppressed it and not paid attention to it. But you will notice that in chapters 4 and 5, a seven-sealed scroll is introduced to John. This scroll, which is rolled up, has seals along the edges, seven of them. In order to get into the contents of the scroll, John has to break the seals. At the breaking of each one of these seals, he gets a preview of what is to come. Why do I say this? John has not entered the document yet. He has not broken all of the seals. It is kind of like when we buy a book. This is a rough analogy. We open it up and see on the dust cover a description of what is going to be inside the book. Likewise, John gets these previews of the important elements of what is going to take place once the scroll is opened up. We have the seven sealed scrolls. Then later in the book, John was given another book, and he was told that he is to prophesy again. Let us reconsider Revelation 10, 7 through 11. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he is about to sound, then the mystery of God is finished, as he preached to his servants, the prophets. Then the voice which I heard from heaven, I heard again speaking with me and saying, Go, Take the book which is open in the hand of the angel who stands on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel, telling him to give me the little book, and he said to me, Take it and eat it. It will make your stomach bitter, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it, and in my mouth it was sweet as honey. And when I had eaten it, my stomach was made bitter. And they said to me, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. At the beginning of the section of Things Which Will Take Place After This, John is given a scroll. He is shown a scroll that has seven seals, and when it is opened, and when God has finally explained to him what that is all about, then John encounters another book, a small book, which is in the hand of the angel who stands upon the sea. Near the end of this section, John is told to pick up that book and eat that book because he is going to prophesy again. This is not hard to figure out. John has one prophecy, the seven-sealed scroll, and now he's going to prophesy again. This time, he is told he's going to prophesy over many people, tongues, and nations. Previously, he has prophesied about only one. Now he is going to prophesy about many. To put it very simply, there are two prophecies here. We have a prophecy about a particular people, a nation, the seven-sealed scroll, and then John is going to prophesy again, internationally, over many peoples. At the end of the book of Revelation, we will see a reference to what God is going to do at the end of history. The important thing for the church, living in persecution in John's day, is to see that Christ is going to defeat all of their enemies. They are going to see the victory of Christ's kingdom. 
There is going to be a judgment prophecy against a particular nation, and that nation is Israel. God is going to finally be done covenantally with these people who have crucified the Messiah. John sees a prophecy where Israel is going to be destroyed by God. And then there's going to be an explanation in chapter 12 of how that victory was possible. And the explanation always has to do with things that are behind the scenes. We must remember how Paul says, Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers. Ephesians 6.12 That truth is seen here in the book of Revelation. We see earthly events where Israel is being destroyed and the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is going to ascend. If we want to know how that is possible, we have to look behind the scenes. It is a battle between principalities and powers, and so John will explain to us that Satan has been cast down from his position of ascendancy. He has been cast down to the earth. He has not been successful in persecuting the woman who brings forth the man-child. The woman who brought forth the man-child is the Jewish church. Satan is going to persecute the Jewish church, but he will not, in fact, destroy those who are faithful Jews who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jerusalem will be destroyed, but God's people will escape to the mountains, those who truly belong to him. Satan will then be all the more wrathful, having been cast down to the earth. In chapter 13, John turns and sees that Satan is now working with another power, and this is where the beast rises from the Mediterranean Sea. If we follow this as a drama, it is not difficult at all. It is quite impressive. Satan is behind the scenes, and Satan himself is foiled when God destroys the Jewish people. He did so in A.D. 70, when the Roman army went in and finally destroyed the temple, the abomination of desolation, and plowed the ground over the temple as a way of showing that this was finally done. But before the Romans did that, they had pulled back from the city for a short period, and according to Jesus' own instruction, those who believed in him fled the city of Jerusalem. The Christians were not destroyed in A.D. 70. Only the unbelieving Jews were. Satan did not accomplish what he was hoping to accomplish, and now he goes on to persecute the rest of the seed of the woman that are throughout the world, that is, the Gentile church. We now see the beast rising from the Mediterranean Sea. Who is the enemy of the second section of the book of Revelation? Well, if you were in Palestine and looked across the Mediterranean Sea, what are you looking at? Italy, you're looking at Rome. The Jews who persecuted the people of God are going to be dealt with in the first scroll. And then Satan will go on to persecute the people of God internationally in the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire will be dealt with in the small book where John prophesies again. But this time there will be many tribes and peoples and tongues. Since chapter 12 has explained how it is that Satan was foiled with respect to the first enemy of God's people, the unbelieving Jews, it should not surprise us that after John talks about the fall of the Roman Empire and the ascendancy of the kingdom of Jesus Christ in chapter 20, he is going behind the scenes again. He will say, and here is what explains it, not only has Satan been cast down to the earth, Jesus bound him and put him in the pit of hell for a particular purpose and with a particular intention in mind. The book of Revelation tells us that this is what is going to happen hereafter. God is going to judge those who persecute you. Those who are apostate Jews in Jerusalem will fall. The account of this is that Satan has been cast down to the earth. He is going to then go and persecute the rest of the church in the empire, and the Roman Empire will persecute you. But God will destroy the Roman Empire, and only the kingdom of Jesus Christ will be sustained in history. He goes behind the scenes to show that the reason for this is that Satan has been bound so that he will not deceive the nations anymore. Now, 
the Great Commission can be fulfilled. At the end of that period spoken of in Revelation 20, where Satan has been bound so that the church can now proclaim the good news and fulfill the Great Commission, God will, for a very short season, release Satan. There will be apostasy. And Jesus will then return in judgment upon the world after we have seen this great worldwide victory for his kingdom. Then there will be a final apostasy, and Jesus will return, and that is where we have the account of the great white throne judgment, and then the introduction of the new heaven and the new earth. Summary We can now see the flow of the book of Revelation. Jesus begins by saying, He wants you to know that He is the glorified Sovereign Savior, and He is with you. He wants you to know that even though you are having a tough time, the Jews hate you and the Romans are persecuting you. Nevertheless, I am with you, and I have all power and authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, you are going to accomplish what I commissioned you to do. You are going to disciple the nations. In chapters 2 and 3, Jesus writes to the seven churches and says, Listen, I have things that I want to commend in you, and I have things that I want to rebuke in you. Repent. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will have the following promise given to him. I expect you to be a victorious church, an overcoming church. I want you to surmount this opposition. My kingdom is going to prevail. Let me tell you what is going to happen hereafter. In the first place, I am going to judge those wicked Jews who are persecuting you and creating trouble for you. They have now filled up their wickedness to the uttermost, and God, in history, is going to repay them. Thus, we see the judgment on the Jewish people. Then we find out that this is because Satan has been cast down to earth. God's people are going to see the victory, even over the Jews, because Satan is being controlled and being dominated by God himself. Satan, however, is not satisfied. He is going to go out and persecute the church in the Roman Empire as well. You are going to see the Roman Empire now arise against the church, but God will destroy it as well. The vision of God destroying the Roman Empire is capped in Revelation 19, with the vision of Jesus himself riding forth on a white horse going out to conquer all opposition. When we read this story, because he is slaughtering everybody who is in his path, we might think this must be a vision of judgment. Look at all that blood, look at that gore. This is terrible stuff. We must remember, however, that this is figurative language symbolic language. John conspicuously tells us in Revelation 19.15 that Jesus rides upon his white horse and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword. It is not that Jesus is taking a literal sword and hacking his enemies to death. He has the right to do that, but that is not what John is talking about. He is talking about the sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth. This is common biblical imagery. We all know that the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Jesus, now proclaiming the Word of God and riding upon a white horse, goes out and he defeats all opposition. Victory in Jesus. This is the Great Commission being fulfilled. We must ask ourselves the question, If God is going to destroy the Jewish persecutors, and he is going to destroy the other persecutors, then his kingdom is going to be the one that conquers the nation. How is that possible? This is where we get the millennial explanation that John gives in Revelation 20. Since God is restraining Satan, he will deceive the nations no more. The word of God is going to conquer the nations, not Satan. He may be active in the world, but with respect to deceiving the nations, he is restrained. He is on a chain. Then, at the very end of history, we will see that even though there is a final apostasy, Jesus will return in judgment and introduce a new heaven and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells. 
at that time, God will wipe every tear from our eyes. This must have been a great encouragement to John as he sat in prison at Patmos. It makes no difference what the Jews say against me or what the Romans want to do to me. Jesus is going to have the final word. He is going to have the final word in history. His kingdom is going to be victorious over the nations. He is going to have the final word in eternity. And in eternity, he will comfort me. All of what I have gone through, all of this tribulation, will have been worthwhile. Demonstration and Confirmation of Thesis Remember the enemy of the first prophecy, that first scroll that is spoken of, is Jerusalem. One of the ways in which you can see that is that in chapter 6, where we have the seals being broken, there is a correspondence between the breaking of the second seal, which is warfare, to Matthew 24-7, the Olivet Discourse. There is a correspondence between the third seal, famine, and the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24-7. The fifth seal, murderous persecution, corresponds with Matthew 24-9. The sixth seal, the shaking of the heavens, corresponds with Matthew 24-29. Go back and look at Matthew 24-34. When Jesus gives that prophecy in his own words, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. We see that Jesus had already taught the church that these sort of things are going to take place as God judges the Jewish people, and it is going to take place in this generation. It did, in fact, take place in that generation because the Gentiles trampled Jerusalem down in A.D. 70. Back in Revelation 6.16, as part of this prelude to the judgment of the first prophecy, we read, And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne. In Luke 23, 27-31, in the midst of the account of our Lord's crucifixion, we read, And following him was a large crowd of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting him. But Jesus, turning to them, said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren, and the wombs that never bore, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? You see, Jesus, as he was going to be crucified, told those who were bewailing him, You ought to weep for yourselves, because God is going to judge you for what you are doing. When did God judge the Jewish people for crucifying Christ? In A.D. 70. And so, Jesus uses the very language that now appears in the book of Revelation. Once again, from Matthew 24, and now from Luke 23, we see that John is giving the same account that Jesus did when he prophesied judgment on the Jews would come from God for their rejection of the Messiah. In Luke 21:24, Jesus says, And they will fall by the edge of the sword, and will be led captive into all the nations, and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Jerusalem is going to be destroyed by the Gentiles. That is what he's talking about. The Jews will be judged of God as he brings the Romans in to destroy their city. Going back to Revelation 11, observe a few real indicators of the situation as to when this judgment comes. First, in Revelation 11:1, 1, Then there was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. At the time of this judgment, the temple is still standing because John was told symbolically to measure it. In verse 2, we read, Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for forty-two months. In Luke twenty-one twenty-four, we read that same language. 
and Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles. What is this city that is going to be trodden under the feet of the Gentiles? Revelation 11.8 tells us, And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Where was Jesus crucified? In Jerusalem. Verse 13 continues, And in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, etc. In terms of the symbolism, therefore, what Revelation 11 tells us is that Jerusalem was still standing, but it is going to be trodden under the foot of the Gentiles. The city is going to fall, the city where our Lord was crucified. I hope that you find some credibility to this interpretation, that the enemy of the first section of the prophecy is the city of Jerusalem. The Jews who have apostatized and not accepted the Messiah, but in fact have persecuted the Messiah's people, now they are going to come under the judgment of God. Revelation 12, 13, 14 And when the dragon saw that he was thrown down to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. He persecuted the Jewish church that had brought forth the Messiah. But the two wings of the great eagle were given to the woman, so that she could fly into the wilderness to her place. In Luke 21, 21-22, Jesus said to his people, those faithful Jews who believed in him, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize that her desolation is near. Then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains, and those who are in the midst of the city must leave, and those who are in the country must not enter the city. According to Christ's instruction, those who were faithful Jews escaped this persecution and they fled. This is what Revelation 12:17 is talking about. So the dragon was enraged with the woman and went off to make war with the rest of her children who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And now chapter 13 introduces us to the beast, the second great enemy of God's people, the beast coming up out of the sea, that empire that is from across the sea, that empire which demands blasphemous worship of the emperor himself. In Revelation 16.10, we read of the seat of this empire, and in Revelation 16.19, there is a great city that falls. But it is Revelation 17.7 7 that helps us the most to identify who this beast is. The angel says to John, And the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and the ten horns. Then look at verse 9. Here is the mind which has wisdom. That is John's way of saying, Stop. You can figure this out. Here is the mind that has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. What is the woman's name? Babylon. Who is the ancient persecuting political force of the Old Testament? Babylon. And so John is again using symbolic language to speak of that great city that runs the empire that persecutes the people of God. But this Babylon is the woman set on seven hills. In all of ancient literature, Rome was known for that poetic title, the city set on seven hills. So Babylon the whore is the city of Rome. Then John is told the seven heads are also seven kings. There is a double imagery here. The beast has heads. Now, if the beast is the Roman Empire, then the heads of the empire are what? The emperors, the kings of Rome. That is exactly what we are told. There are seven kings, the five are fallen, but one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must remain a little while. Revelation 17.10 there are seven emperors of Rome in terms of this vision. John goes on to talk about an eighth and more that will come. But nevertheless, he says there are seven. Five have fallen, and the one now is. And so, John explicitly identifies who it is that is the head of the empire, the head of the beast at this point. It is the sixth emperor of Rome. He says that when the seventh comes, he will rule but just a short time, which is exactly what happened. 
Galba followed the sixth emperor of Rome and lasted only seven months because of the internal civil war in Rome. Then there were two others, who ruled about three months, and another about seven months, and then, finally, Vespasian came to the throne. John was told specifically, I will tell you what I am talking about. It is the city of Rome set on seven hills, and it is the sixth king of Rome. Now who is the sixth king of Rome? The Jews considered the first emperor of Rome to have been Julius Caesar. Julius took the title Emperator. He was the emperor as far as he was concerned. As you know, though, he never made it to the Senate for them to declare this. He was assassinated. But that is a minor detail to the Jews. He acted as an emperor, and he took the title to himself, and they entitled him the first emperor of Rome. If you count down from Julius Caesar, the sixth emperor of Rome is Nero, the man who was persecuting Christians by lighting them on fire, impaling them, and lighting his garden parties. The beastly ruler is Nero. We are told this in Revelation 13:18. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man and his number is 666. In ancient cultures, the letters of the alphabet often served as numerals, so that every name would have its numerical equivalent. We read graffiti from Pompeii that says, I love her whose name is 545. That is a way of declaring your love, but then you had to figure out whose name adds up to 545. So we know what this is all about. If you use your mind, if you have wisdom, you can tell who John is talking about. His name equals 666. In the Talmud, and in the Aramaic document that has been unearthed at Marubat, we know that the Jews referred to Nero as Neron Kaiser. If you add up the numerical equivalent of the name the Jews used for Nero, it is 666. This is not all that hard a book to figure out. Why did John obscure it? Well, where did he write the book from? Exile. Who is going to carry this book to the mainland? Roman people are, right? Soldiers? John is not going to come right out and make more trouble for the Christians who believe in Jesus by just saying, we know that Nero is this beast. He uses symbolic language he keeps winking at his audience. He knows that if you have wisdom, you can figure out what he is talking about. It is the sixth king of Rome whose name is 666. The internal indicators in the book of Revelation should make it clear to us that the second enemy of the people of God that is destroyed in the book of Revelation is the Roman Empire. And these, of course, are the things that took place near at hand in the early days of the church. Jerusalem fell in A.D. 70. Then, in the next 250 years, Rome was finally sacked and done away with. As Jesus said, You have nothing to worry about. I am in your midst, and it is your kingdom, the kingdom that I have given you, that is going to prevail in history. We come to Revelation 19 and we see Jesus now riding forth, conquering the nations and all opposition with the word that proceeds from his mouth. Here then is the course of history according to the book of Revelation. 1. Jesus is with his church and has established the kingdom. 2. The Jews who persecuted are going to be destroyed by God. 3. The Romans who persecuted are going to be destroyed by God. 4. Then the word of God is going to conquer the nations. The Great Commission is going to be fulfilled. 5. At the very end of history, Jesus will come back in judgment and he will introduce the new heavens and the new earth where every tear will be wiped from our eyes and everything will be perfect. That is good news for a persecuted church. We should be encouraged that this is not a book to be set aside. It is not a book to be ignored, nor is it a book to mystify us. God has given this book for our benefit that we might gain doctrine and reproof 
and correction and instruction in righteousness, and that we might be built up in the faith and understand what he intends to do in history. No matter what persecution has come to us, even if it is as bad as the early days of the church, we are on the winning side in history. God will have the final word, and the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will prevail throughout history. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.